history knows many great generals who made fighting Rome the goal of their lives. Suffice it to recall the Carthaginian commander Hannibal, who fought the Republic for more than half a century and almost reached Rome. No less principled enemy of the Romans was an Pontic king Mithridates VI, called Eupator, noble, with whose name are associated three Mithridatovi wars. It is worth noting that it was Mithridates who united the pirates of the eastern Mediterranean against Rome. And only the military talent of Pompey the Great was able to save the merchants of the Republic from ruinous devastation. We talked about this story last time. After defeating the pirates, Pompey had the honor of fighting Mithridates himself to put an end to Rome's war with the kingdom of Pontus. Pontic kingdom spread on the southern shore of the Black Sea when the Macedonian commander of Persian origin Mithridates fell into disfavor with King Antigonus and with loyal people fled to Asia Minor, where he founded a new kingdom. Becoming known as Mithridates I, for many years Pontus remained a small Hellenic state, until the new heir to the Pontic throne, King Mithridates VI, who took the throne, did not start his conquest campaigns. The first military success of the young commander was the victory over the neighboring Scythians and the annexation of their capital, Scythian Naples, located in the modern Crimea, and Chersonese, for which Mithridates received his nickname Eupator. The Pontic Hoplites conquered Colchis, modern Abkhazia, western Georgia and northeastern Turkey, and Mithridates declared himself heir to the Colchian kings and Persian satraps. Pontus became an increasingly weighty state on the map of the ancient world, which inevitably clashed the interests of the Pontic king and the Roman senate. The Republic had great influence on Asia Minor, and neighboring with Pontus Pergamon and Bithynian kingdoms closely cooperated with Rome. Mithridates secretly made an alliance with the Bithynian elite, thanks to which after a couple of years captured the region of Paphlagonia on the Black Sea coast. The Bithynian people appealed to Rome for help, and the Republic would not hesitate to punish the insolent eastern neighbor, but it was in these years all the forces of the legions were thrown into the war with the warlike Cimbrians. The territorial claims of King Mithridates did not end there. By right of inheritance Eupator decided to regain these lands and make war against the young King Ariuretus VII. When Mithridates realized that the forces of their armies were equal and the war would be too costly and bloody, he summoned Ariuretus to the negotiations and in front of everyone himself stabbed his opponent with a hidden dagger. Cappadocians refused to resist, and for a time Pontus took possession of their country, but terror and exorbitant fees from the population caused a revolt and a new war for the throne of Cappadocia. This time the Senate could not miss the opportunity to interfere in the affairs of Hellenic states and demanded that the Pontians left the lands of Paphlagonia and Cappadocia. According to the Roman historian Plutarch, Consul Gaius Marius personally met with Eupator and told him, either try to accumulate more forces than the Romans, or keep silent and do what you are ordered. At that time, greater forces than the Romans, the Ponians did not have. The second time Mithridates faced Rome in the 90s, when the war for the throne began in Bithynia. One of the heirs, Socrates, appealed to Pontus for help, and was supplied with arms and money. However, after the Senate intervened in the war, the Pontic king withdrew his support of Socrates to please the Romans. The peace with Rome, however, did not last long. First and Second Mithridates Wars Mithridates Eupator with a short interval spent two wars with the Republic, because the two powers, claiming world domination, did not have enough space on such a limited area of land. The Senate had tried more than once to put the Pontic king in his place by directly challenging his foreign policy. This could have continued, but Eupator decided that he had enough strength for an open conflict with a powerful neighbor. The formal reason for the outbreak of war with Rome was the invasion of King Nicomedes IV of Bithynia, a supporter of the Republic, into Pontus. However, the superior army of Bithynians was broken by flank attack of Serpanosni chariots, 
and Nicomedes himself fled to the camp of the Roman consul Manius Aquilius. Pontians broke into the Roman camp and defeated it, after which Nicomedes retreated to Pergamum, and Manius, on Lesbos, whence he was extradited to Mithridates and executed. Pontic army seized the Black Sea Straits and entered the Aegean Sea. However, the Pontic army did not achieve great success at sea. Mithridates' warriors could not take Rhodes, a stronghold of Roman and Bithynian forces, and retreated to Pergamum, declared the new Pontic capital. Then Mithridates, hitherto known as a gracious and just ruler, gave a secret order for the extermination of all Romans and Italians in Asia Minor. In this merciless massacre, which came to be known as the Ephesian Vespers, more than 80,000 people were killed. Of course, the Senate could not leave such a thing unanswered. Pontians took possession of most of the Aegean Sea, and serious resistance to them provided only on Delos, when the siege killed more than 20,000 Romans. Mithridates' generals went to Boeotia, region of Middle Greece, near Thebes, where the Pontic strategist Mithraphanes was defeated by the Macedonian governor Bruteus Sura and was forced to retreat. There was a lull in Greece, but soon interrupted. Five Roman legions led by Lucius Cornelius Sulla landed on the peninsula. Sulla besieged Athens and Piraeus, and in the siege of the second he was helped by the kings of Syria, Egypt and Rhodes, blocking the approach to the city from the sea. Sulla tried to take Piraeus by storm, but the attack failed, and he returned to the siege. At the same time, Sulla refused the citizens of Athens, exhausted by the siege and asked for peace, and took the city by storm. Piraeus fell in its wake. Sulla faced the Pontic troops at the city of Cheronea. On the side of the Romans were 15,000 infantry and 15,000 horsemen against the huge army of Pontus in 50,000 infantry, 10,000 horsemen and 90 war chariots. The legionaries successfully repulsed the cavalry and chariot attack, and the retreating horsemen mixed up the ranks of the Pontian infantry. This allowed the Romans to cut into the enemy formation and turn it into flight. It is not known how the fate of Mithridates and Pontus, if Sulla was not recalled to Greece. A year later, Boeotia again went to the Pontic king, and the Roman commander was able to teach him another lesson. The armies of Rome and Pontus met again at Orchomenus, on the Great Plain. Expecting an attack of enemy cavalry, Sulla ordered to dig a ditch in the middle of the field, but the Pontian cavalry dispersed the Roman diggers and turned the army in flight. Sulla with difficulty gathered his soldiers and the second time has successfully repulsed all attacks. The victory remained for Rome. After the defeat at Orchomenus Mithridates was forced to make peace with the Republic. Initially, Sulla put forward very strict conditions, including the transfer of the Pontic fleet to Rome, the coverage of military expenses and the refusal of the conquered territories. Only during the long negotiations held by Mithridates and Sulla at the city of Dardanae, the generals came to mutually acceptable terms. The peace concluded in Dandanae did not last long, and soon a new conflict broke out. Legate Sulla Morena at the head of two legions on his own initiative invaded the Pontic Kingdom, accusing Mithridates in preparation for war with Rome. Within two years, Eupator forced the legate to leave Pontus, and peace was concluded at Sulla's request. War with Pompey Seven years had passed since Rome had made peace with the kingdom of Pontus. Over the years, the Republic had been shaken not only by wars along its countless borders, but also by civil conflicts as Sulla the Lucky continued his uneasy path to power. During the years of civil war, many Romans fled the country, settling in neighboring lands, and some of them were ready to return home in arms. So, at the expense of Roman fugitives Mithridates was able to gather an army of as many as 140,000 infantrymen and 16,000 horsemen. In addition, Eupator enlisted the support of Mediterranean pirates, ready to put up to 400 ships against Rome. Thus, Pontus got the best chance to finally get even with the Republic.
Mithridates again invaded Cappadocia and Bithynia and defeated the Romans at Chalcedon. However, the success was short-lived. Having unleashed a full-scale war on the peninsula, the Ponians suffered enormous losses in winter. Roman commander Lucullus defeated the Pontic fleet and the indestructible force of his legions knocked the enemy out of Bithynia. Lucullus inflicted Pontic crushing defeat at Kibera, after which Mithridates took refuge with his longtime ally, the king of Great Armenia Tigranes II. From there, Eupator had only to watch the Roman legions seize the Pontic cities one by one. The Senate demanded from the Armenian king the extradition of Mithridates and used the expected refusal as an excuse to declare war. The following spring, Lucullus with two legions crossed the Euphrates and reached Tigranokert, the capital of the Armenian kingdom. Tigranes was amazed by the pace of the Roman invasion. No sooner had he received the notice of the beginning of the war and gathered his army then the Roman legionaries were already on the approach to the capital. Tigranokert was built as a huge fortress, but it was neither fully completed nor populated. On defense of the city stood the army, in many ways superior in numbers to the legionaries of Lucullus, but Tigranes himself was afraid to take risks and fled into the interior, leaving his generals in the fortress. To be fair, the Armenian army was extremely motley in its national composition and not completely loyal to its king. Tigranes planned to populate the new capital with people from different lands, and they made up his army Armenians, Iberians, Muslims, Albanians, Arabs and Jews. Lucullus' army, on the contrary, included selected legionaries, veterans of military campaigns, who fought for more than five years in a row. The indestructible Roman legions smashed the enemy's unsteady ranks and put them to flight. The Romans inflicted a crushing defeat on Tigranes, and the prosperity of the ancient Armenian kingdom came to an end. However, the Romans achieved much less success on the sea. For several years they could not eradicate pirates. Sea robbers defeated the fleet of Mark Antony. But even this foe was well within the grasp of the Roman war machine. In last week's installment, we discussed how Pompey the Great, given extraordinary powers by the Senate, easily rid the Mediterranean of pirates. While retaining these powers, Pompey was given command in the war against Mithridates and Tigranes II. Pompey invaded Pontus. He inflicted a crushing defeat on Mithridates at the Lycus River, effectively ending the struggle with the Pontic Kingdom. Eupator was in the same situation as Hannibal for many years before him incessant wars with Rome exhausted the kingdom, and to collect a new army was no longer possible. But it was too early for Pompey to return to Rome victorious. The son of King Tigranes II, called by the same name, made an alliance with the Parthians and began a struggle for power in Armenia against his father. He invaded the country and besieged the city of Artashot though without result. Under the threat of war with Rome and the Parthians at the same time, Tigranes too had to make peace with the Republic, and for this it was necessary to extradite Mithridates Eupator to the Senate. Mithridates learned in advance that a reward for his head was appointed in Armenia, and fled to the last stronghold of his possessions, the Bosporan Kingdom, stretching in the Crimea and the Taman Peninsula. The war in Armenia ended with a Roman-led peace. Pompey was in no hurry to return to Rome. His powers allowed him to independently conduct foreign policy, start wars and conclude alliances. Victory in the Mithridates War was perceived as the end of the campaign started by Lucullus, and Pompey went to the Caucasus to consolidate his fame as a conqueror. Pompey crossed the borders of the Iberian ruler Artok and defeated his army. Artok immediately requested peace, the condition of which was the issue of the heirs to the Iberian throne as hostages to Rome. From Iberia Pompey has gone through Colchis to Pontic lands, has established blockade of Bosporus and has gone to Caucasian Albania. On the left bank of the river Abant, Alazani, Romans have collided with an army of Albanians. The number of enemies in this time did not become a problem for Rome. 
The Albanian army was defeated. The Albanian king Oroas requested peace. Pompey continued the campaign to the east and turned back only after almost reaching the shores of the Caspian Sea. The next goal of the Roman commander was Syria, where there was a struggle for power between the heirs of the Seleucid dynasty. Pompey without special labor was able to win the state destroyed by war and to make it the Roman province. A similar political situation developed in neighboring Syria and Judea, where there was a civil war between the heirs of Hasmoneans. Pompey again went to restore order in foreign lands. As a result of lengthy negotiations with both claimants to the throne, the Romans sided with Aristobulus, but only until he began to disobey Pompey and reneged on his previous promises a large reward and the surrender of Jerusalem. Pompey broke all agreements with Aristobulus, took him prisoner, and marched on Jerusalem, the gates of which were opened to him by Hyrcanus' supporters. Aristobulus's army fortified itself on the Temple Mount, which Pompey took after three months of siege. Judea became a kingdom dependent on Rome. Hyrcanus was given the title of ethnarch, ruler of the people, and high priest. King Mithridates Eupator, meanwhile, was killed in a rebellion. He never fought his last battle with Rome. During the years of the Asian campaign Pompey not only significantly expanded the borders of the Republic, but also strengthened on the throne of neighboring states loyal to Rome rulers. The fate of the Kingdom of Pontus is very sad the western part was annexed to the Roman Bithynia. The eastern part was transferred to the King of Galatia. So the history of the whole country ended with the death of its last king. The further fate of Pompey is known to us from the stories of Julius Caesar. After the creation of the first triumvirate, Pompey the Great spent more and more time on politics and less and less on wars. His vanity did not allow him to admit defeat to his former friend Caesar, and the last defender of the Republic was ignominiously killed by the servants of King Ptolemy. This once again illustrates a simple truth the greatest man always remains a man. As Mithridates Eupator forever inscribed Pontus in the pages of ancient history, but in fact was the last king of his country, so Pompey became one of the great generals, which, as we can see, did not save him from the knife of an assassin.